welcome to the Movie Scramble podcast interview special. In this episode, I'm talking to director Adrian Shergold, who was at the Glasgow Film Festival to present his film Denmark, a bittersweet comedy that stars Rafe Spall. Enjoy. I'm 34 years old. I've been out of work as long as I can remember. My own mother's ashamed of me. Your father was a pain in the ass, but you know what? I think you've even beaten him. I live beneath a mental case who plays loud music day and night. But when I come from, there isn't a chance. Oh, shut up, you pussy! Sometimes getting locked up is in prison is a five-star experience. And it definitely is if you're doing time in Denmark. So you started as an actor? I did. And obviously, I mean, you, you've had a long career. I, I, I didn't want to say long. That yeah, I've <laughs> <I'm> an old dog. <laughs> so, <clears throat> did you always want to direct or was it something um, that you were... <clears throat> no, it sort of came by absolute chance. I was, um, I went to drama school, trained as an actor, thought that's what I wanted to be. I worked for about eight years as an actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just felt a great sense of, yeah, much as I enjoyed the idea of being an actor, I didn't really feel like I was being fulfilled and I was always waiting for that phone to ring and all that stuff was going on. And I had quite a busy eight years and I worked with some fantastic directors, Mike Lee and Jane Howe, and I worked with Tony Scott, with, you know, Alan Parker. Yes. <clears throat> they were just making commercials at that point. But I, that, so I met all those sort of guys and I think what happened was a friend of mine started a very small uh, lunchtime theatre in mm-hmm. London and he... He asked me to help only because he thought I could bang a nail in straight. That was about it, you know, so on a physical level. And we started this small theatre in South London. And, uh, you know, we, we thought we'd have control. Actors would have control over their destiny. But in fact, we realised almost straight away, you had to be, you had to decide what you were going to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he asked me to direct one play. He said, would you direct one play? I said, well, I don't I'm not a director. And, but I knew a writer really well called Barry Keefe. And I'd written, I'd been in some of his plays. So I asked Barry whether I could direct one of his plays, and um, I just got the bug. I mean, the moment I did it, I realised that's what I should have been doing. Yeah. Um, and from that moment on, I just sort of just strove to do that. And I, but I always really, to be honest, loved film and cinema. And um, as you know, as a kid, it was the, you know I used to get there and be so excited. And I still am excited by going to the movies more than I am going to the theatre. It's mm-hmm. a bit of hit and miss the theatre, but. Somehow cinema, you think, well, I, you know, I'm going to invest in this. and So I just loved film. Um, and I was brought up on sort of the 60s films, you know, the sort of Joseph Losey and, mm-hmm. and ex, you know, the extraordinary bunch of people, Louis Marle and stuff like that. Yes. Um, uh, so, I, um, so I started directing. And then I got onto the BBC Directors course, um, which meant I went off and did like three months working in, at the BBC as an as a independent... I mean, it was an uh, exterior... I want to say exterior... It was an outside director's course, so they brought five directors from the theatre in and trained them to be what they thought were TV directors. Mm-hmm. Um, I did that course, and um, then I just chased around the BBC with my tape saying, give me a job, and eventually got my job and started directing TV drama. And from then I just wanted, you know, I wanted to pursue the whole thing about trying to make films, single films. But I, you know, in that career I had a fantastic, um, done some fantastic jobs, like, you know, The Winter Sun, I worked for Channel 4 doing a film called Clapham Junction, did um, a thing called um, uh, Births, Marriages and Deaths, Tony Brown's thing. I did a fantastic series called Holding On for the BBC, which was an eight-part thing mm-hmm. written by Tony Marchant, who was a friend of mine, and we worked together for years. And a sort of bug just took over. And oddly enough, I, at that time, I still wanted to make independent single films, but actually there wasn't the market then. And then it started to become a market for it. But you met people like Working Title, and said, well, you know, you're always busy, why are you worrying? Why do you want to make single films? But I did. And then slowly out of that, you know, I've made single films and so on and so on. So it's been a sort of, you know, I've come from the wrong side of the tracks in one way. I was a working class South London boy. And when I started off directing, I realised that predominantly it was it was Oxbridge. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the industry, the BBC was Oxbridge. And um, so you were sort of fighting that thing in a sort of nice way. And the people that had an influence on me early on were people like Alan Clark. Uh, TV director, film director, mm-hmm. um, and Mike Lee was really helpful to me. I, he was my monitor when I was an arts council director. So that's how it all started. Nice, that's really good. You obviously spoke about your variety of work. What, what do you prefer? Do you prefer <coughs> television work or do you prefer uh, films? When, when the best thing about films, uh, you know, t- TV tends to be like fish and chip paper, you know, it's like it's on and it's out and mm-hmm. it's thrown away. 
There's something about the longevity of film. So you feel like you've got a film and actually it's more personal and you pursue it and you, you know, you try and keep it going and you, it has a life, it has more of a life. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, if it's something you really care about, you feel much more connected to it. Uh, it's more the auteur thing that actually, you know, you're much more to do with the process. Yes. I've just been doing a thing in, um, in Europe for a German company with ZDF money and Fuji Films money. And as much as I enjoy it, it's a bit like suddenly you're, you're in a producer-led industry rather than a director-led industry. Mm -hmm. And films is much more generally director-led. Yeah, the director has the, the TV focus. tends to be writer-led and producer-led. Mm -hmm. so yes. That's the big difference. I noticed with your TV work, you tend not to just drop in and out of series, especially series <coughs> that you've been doing recently. You've been involved with, well, there was uh, four and five episodes of a particular yeah, series. Yeah, I always thought I would, to be honest, I, you know, what I did with the, the German project, they initially I read all nine scripts, or I had ten scripts of this thing, and I always assumed that that's what I'd do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd do all the ten. Um, and then just purely because of the logistics of that, they didn't want to do that. But I remember, you know, sometime years ago when Poldark restarted, I met the people talking to Poldark, and I said, well, I'd only be interested if I did the whole lot the whole first series, mm -hmm. just to keep a continuity with actors and the way you yes. shoot and so on and so on. But in fact, I realised with something like that, they didn't want, not in a rude way, they didn't want a director to have that much say. Mm -hmm. They wanted it to be kept by, you know, that mammoth film, so very much that wanted to have a sort of producer-led series rather than a, than a auteur strike director's led. So yes, mainly that's what I've done. I've always done the whole lot. Yes. Or nothing. But, you know, the world keeps on changing, so, you know, I was, when, I, when I was... Uh, I remember having sort of flirtations with America and going to America to do TV stuff and you know high-end TV stuff. Mm -hmm. But somehow I felt like, you know, it was it's a it's an alarming process. You've got three weeks prep, you shoot for ten days, you go into an event for five days, and you go. Yes. Um, you're paid a large amount of money, a lot more than they would be paid in the UK. But somehow it just seems like, you know, you're you're just doing a, a management job rather than a yeah, director's job. You're under a certain amount of pressure just yeah. to produce something in what it's basically <clears throat> yeah. three weeks time and then just um, move yeah. away from it yeah. yeah i mean when i started uh, the window I, and they, my german producer kept saying you're the lead director but actually i realized i was just director number one mm -hmm. i don't mean rudely yeah. there was going to be a director number two who's now working or a german director and i realized that i'm sort of on the, i'm removed from it now i'm watching all the rushes but they're not really saying to me you know you've got no, i'm not a showrunner as such mm -hmm. so it isn't the same thing as as a film would be or a single thing or a, or for a Part project. I'd like to talk obviously about Denmark, Denmark as well. The opening scene of Denmark just before the credits, before the actual title comes up and says Denmark, I thought it was a wonderful piece of work. It just told you pretty much everything that you needed to know about the character and the situation before he really even uttered a word. How did you pull that all together? Was that all in the script? It was, it was some of it, no, some of it was in the script, um, but Jeff doesn't write details, he doesn't write, he didn't write the amount. I mean, you know, he had a single bed sit where this guy lives in and he wakes up and, you know, he's got to do his birthday card thing. But the story, did, the filmically didn't tell you much about Herb. Um, mm -hmm. And that was my, so it's my job, you know, it's my yes. job to do that. Interestingly enough, when we first showed that to the execs, they were quite jumpy about that as an opening scene. Because actually, you know, Joe Oppenheimer, who was the BBC producer, sort of said, you know, I don't really like these shots that do this. But I just fought for it. I just thought it was a really good way of doing it. And I didn't want to, you know, I, I didn't want to um, compromise on it. Yes. So I just stuck with it and it got in there. And, uh, you know, it's a one shot shot. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, you start with him and then you drift around. There he is and he's doing his thing and so on and so on. So actually, for me, it was, um, it does tell you the story. It tells you a lot of stories about him. What I loved last night with the audience was that they um, they get it straight away. Mm -hmm. But convincing producers that, I mean, people look for hooks. You know, everyone's looking for a hook to yes. start something off. And it's a gentle hook, it's not a sharp hook. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, that the film's a gentle film in a way. It's not, it's not, you can't turn it into something it's not. And it was written by, you know, a lovely writer who has that sort of feel to him. And that's what I wanted to achieve. Yeah, it was more the when he comes out of the door and he glances back <coughs> and you just know from there that there's something... Horrible about that place. Yeah, it's, yeah. it repulses him. Yeah. It just does. And from there you just go, OK, right, I'm, I'm in yeah. for this character yeah, and yeah. I'm in for this film because of the way they yeah, opened. Yeah. I thought it was, it was very clever and as you say, it's, it is very subtle as well. Yeah. 
So was that the case in the rest of the film? As you say, the, the script and the story itself was laid out, but it was up to you to. Oh yeah, absolutely. Fill in I all mean, there was we, you know, we had to invent things for it because obviously, you know, I think they'd been to look at Denmark as a location before mm-hmm. I joined, but, but then we went back and we had to find those streets and find the place to make it work and yes. find the club and so on and so on. So yes, my job inevitably becomes much more to do with another way of storytelling. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, there was something slightly, when I first read the script, I was slightly worried that it was, a, 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 it felt like, um, it felt like it fit into what was then BBC films. It felt like it had one of those, uh, you know, like Pride and so on and so on. It felt like it had to have, a, it felt like it was in a system where you have the beginning and then you have some moment where everyone sings a song and then, you, oh my God, is this, and I, <laughs> I just wanted to fight against that so it didn't feel like it was too much of that sort of, you know the, the nice feel-good BBC films, which mm-hmm. are, were some lovely films, and Pride was a great film. But you just felt like I wanted it to have a bit more edge to it, and so did you know Rave. So we talked quite a lot about it, and we spent quite a lot of time working on talking before we started shooting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it's interesting the way that the stuff that was filmed in Wales was very dark and gritty, and it, it was very. It seemed to be very washed out. <clears throat> but then, as soon as you go over to Denmark and everything about that is a lot brighter, it's lighter, it's wider yeah. as well. You've, you're using an awful lot of wide shots yeah. because it's a far more interesting landscape. Than, I know when there's obviously areas in Wales that are beautiful as well, but you didn't concentrate on those. It was very town-based. Yeah. It was going up and down hills, yeah. it was cobbled streets, yeah. all this sort of stuff, which could be seen as being well, sort of stereotypical, but it's been done in a certain way that I like the way that it was. That it contrasted that. So I take it that was a a very conscious decision when you yeah, were doing it was, that. and it was also yeah, it was about um, for me. It was like you know, I, I live in East Anglia, Norfolk, so I'm, you know, I'm used to those flat, big skies, mm-hmm. and I love them. And actually, Denmark's got the same sort of landscape, and it felt to me that you know, someone like Herb, who was trapped in a basement flat in a, up a hill in a little tiny village in on, on those valleys, you know, was trapped in that world, and to get out, so the world would change in the moment he got off that boat. Everything yes. was different. And he got to that square and everything's different. And he got to a little hotel room and slightly Cohen-esque, but not, you know, mm-hmm. not to an extreme. Um, and then obviously, you know, it's a sort of fairy tale after that. But. Yes, it completely changes. You're expecting a certain narrative up until the point when he gets off and because he's there to do a yeah. particular job. And it obviously doesn't work out that way, but it was, it was quite a nice wee surprising turn. Yeah, yeah. You make use of props in the film, like, for instance, the, the wee laugh box yeah. to indicate that he doesn't think anything's funny anymore. Yeah. The fact that he's wearing his father's shoes, he's literally wearing dead man's yeah. shoes. Yeah. The, the introduction of the dog as well, which yeah. I thought was really nice. That's, that's obviously a nice kind of, as you say, a fairy tale element, you know, like yeah. you've got a sidekick now and it's obviously man's best friend. Was that all just part of the process? You brought all that together? Uh, we to brought a lot of that together. In? I mean, the laughing box was, it, the, I, I, it's mine, I had it at home. And I, and I thought right. I'd put it in a box with it in his stuff. And uh, it was a prop that actually became quite crucial. Mm-hmm. I mean, initially it was just intended to have one little moment. Yes. And then we, there was a whole discussion when we, almost when we'd finished the film about how we bring us back to that, to some moment. Mm-hmm. And it was sort of a MacGuffin. And I thought, well, actually, I suddenly remembered how this little box and that, you know, if he took it to Denmark with him and then he showed it to her. It would it would have that little moment about laughter and happiness and you know yeah. madness. So it was very much a last thing. It was not in the script. It was just purely invented by me to give that character something to play. You know, it was something I had at home. And I remember on the very last day of the shoot, there was um, they couldn't find it. Someone had it, and, and I had to wait like an hour and a half for it to be discovered <laughs> to put it in that box in that room. Otherwise, it would never. And thank God I did because yeah, it became course. a very important little key to it. Mm-hmm. And yes, the shoes that was that was Jeff stuff, and um, but it meant that we you know you just added those little layers the whole time. Yes, yeah, I did layers to some. Well, I felt that there was characters that didn't get an awful lot of screen time, but yeah. you you were drawn into them because of this the the, the wee touches and yeah. things like that, that. I mean, we you know I mean in, you know in terms of where. Herb was brought up. You could have said he was brought up in the valleys in a little village, but I put his mum in Port Talbot because mm-hmm. it's, it's such a bleak landscape as well. And uh, and then in a, some flats that were, you know, I just thought this is grim. This is grim. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if we shot we shot Denmark first and we shot Wales second. Oh, okay. um, I think that was just purely logistics, but it did actually make and it felt you know Denmark went very smoothly and Wales was much tougher. Mm-hmm. And actually, I think that shows in the film and it makes it work for that reason. So. Obviously, you said you were working in Denmark. You've done an awful lot of 
international, like you mentioned, uh, you work in Germany and yeah. everything as well. How do you find it working with international crews? Is it just the same? Uh, Basically, you're speaking the same filmic language or what? You're speaking the same filmic language. I've just been working with a Dutch camera. I mean, my, my crew on the window was Flemish, French, Dutch, German. Mm-hmm. And I was the, and there was an English writer and me, and an English, predominantly English cast, or a, a, the major cast is English. And it was really interesting to work there because um, it, what was inter- what was bizarrely interesting is that I didn't have to join in with any chit chat. Mm-hmm. And, and my wife said every time I said, "She said you're very rude." I said, "No, I'm not." It just meant I was actually concentrating on that. Yes. So people wanted to ask me a question, they came and asked me in English because mm-hmm. I don't speak Flemish and I speak a little tiny bit of French. So it made it, it in a strange way. It makes you concentrate better because you're not sidetracked by the gossip. You know, sometimes actors, if you do a dinner table scene, you just have to walk away because they, they get, go into dinner table mode and they tell each other stories and they mm. like, shut up. So basically it was, it, it helps concentration. And I've always had a, I've just enjoy it. I enjoy the, the, you know, the experience of working somewhere different. I mean, Belgium was where we've been shooting the window. It's a much more laid back system than the UK. And you think, wow, do they get away with this? You know, like one morning I arrived and they, they said, oh, the uh, ca- camera truck's not here yet. And I said, what do you mean not here yet? You know, we're, we're all here, why is it not here? <laughs> they said it got stuck in traffic. And I went, okay, fine. That's, you know, and then you just, people are just more, it's more laid back. Yes. But in some ways you have, you just sort of accept that to a degree and expect it, and like, oh, that's the Belgian way. Um, it can be very frustrating because you've still got a time frame to work in, but, and I think in different places it works differently. I mean, Denmark was very organized. It's a very organized country. Yes. And everything clicked. And word. I mean, we were predominantly we had a we had a Welsh crew with us there, mm-hmm. and for them it was like they had to rethink their job descriptions to a degree. Yes, you, you have to adapt <coughs> to yeah. the situation, I suppose. Don't yeah, you? yeah. The soundtrack of the film, which is very interesting, obviously Richard Hawley. You've worked with him in the past. Yeah, I did a film called Funny Cow yes. um, with Maxine, and Richard was going to write the music from that from the word go, and I just loved him. I loved the way he works, and. Um, you know, when we were spotting films, he'd come in and, um, you know, you, you, I almost thought, he once said, oh, hang on, I've just got, I've got, I've got this, uh, 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 and he starts sort of, do, 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 and he sings something to it. No other composer I've worked with does that, and mm-hmm. they're much more. And then he searches his attic and digs out bits of songs and things that he wants to reinvent for the film. Um, he's just a pleasure to work with. He's a delightful man. He's fantastically good at his job. And he, I think he's at a stage when he would like to do more stuff like this. Mm-hmm. And, and not necessarily always songs, but sometimes, you know, yes, yes. score, score. Mm-hmm. And he's actually done a, a, a musical in Sheffield, which is coming to London, to the, to the National. And I'm really pleased for, for him that that's, you know, he's involving another sort of move forward. So is he involved with. right from the start of the process? Does he get to see the <coughs> script? Or he is he it wasn't on? involved in Denmark that way, because originally they were talking about various other people that they wanted to, pursue and then they couldn't actually do it for all sorts of logistical mm-hmm. reasons and I went back to Ed and said look what about Richard Hawley because I've done a job with him I know he'll be good I know he's a great songwriter and, and he writes songs for us but on Funny Cow he was there from the workout so he wrote, even wrote the Funny Cow opening song before we'd even shot the film so and it was you know it works yeah of course yeah it really <coughs> does yes obviously you've had, been involved in so many different types of projects and films obviously Funny Cow and Denmark there's certain similarities in the sort of social aspects of people trying to basically break break the circle I think Herb says that's what he wanted to yeah. do he had to take drastic action break the circle what draws you to these sort of projects like you say you've, you've been busy forever um, so I think it's you know it's funny because I've always felt um, I, I like I love things that actually have an emotional Real strong emotional connection, mm-hmm. and um, you know, even for me personally, some you know, some of Herb's. I was watching it last night. I thought, you know, Herb's on a suicide mission, really. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not there to get in prison; he's there to get killed almost. But you know, he's not. We don't play that level, that degree. But you know, you realise this man's. There's something about you know the mood of the country and the mood of the place. And, you know, when Brexit's going on, we love you know with the coronavirus. You feel there's a real sense of like doom about. Them the world at the moment which yeah, I, I don't yeah. particularly enjoy but I actually do I do get caught up in it to a degree so emotionally I want to get caught up in my characters and I almost feel like when I'm working you know I, I sort of live it I, I might be but by the grace of God go them not me mm-hmm. but I do feel like I want to connect emotionally with characters and in a way Denmark wasn't quite as you know it wasn't quite as emotionally pulling as some, some things but it was just a very for me a very enjoyable film to make but I do tend to do quite dark stuff uh, maybe because I've got a very dark side 
<laughs> so I, I'm intrigued by my own dark side. So, and, and as you get older, so I think actually, I, you know, I still have such a, a, a thirst and enthusiasm for doing it. I love filming. I just think it's a fantastic job. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not, I call it playing in the sandpit. Obviously, you come from an acting background. So, does that inform how you actually approach working with actors? <clears throat> to a degree, it does. Obviously, I, when I'm shooting something, I've, I've got to have my film head on because it's how you're going to shoot it. But to a degree, I often know what I don't do. A lot of directors would actually bring actors on the set and rehearse and then send them off to get ready. I, I, I usually spend, I, I just on a very simple way of shooting, I usually say, can you get the actors ready and we'll start rehearsing and then we're going to shoot. Mm-hmm. We don't have a little gap in between. Where they, there might be tweaks to do for lighting, but not a whole long gap. Because I always feel like actors, you know, rehearse something, go away. By the time you come back, they've sort of lost some of the impetus. And I sometimes start shooting, but not if I, when I'm shooting on the old days of shooting on film, you couldn't do this, but with um, digital, you can actually start shooting sometimes when you're not quite ready. Mm-hmm. And in a way, the thing develops, and you see a bit more you can get out of that shot, and a bit more. So the shot can develop, and in it, the actors can develop it, and you get actors who have a real sense of film and do it. Ray's, um, Ray's one of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ray Winston, I just mentioned him, he, he's another actor you can do that with. You know, you know that he'll actually keep on developing as you go. Yes, yes. Um, and enjoy the pleasure of it. But it is a mutual, it's got to be a sense of trust between the director and the actress. Otherwise, sometimes you're asking them to do things that they don't feel like they're very comfortable with. I mean, well, I did a thing called a series called Mad Dogs with Phil Glenister and John Sim and Max Beasley and Mark Warren. And I used to take the chairs off the set because if the chairs were on the set, they'd sit down the bastards. <laughs> and now again, that. Goes towards the momentum of the yeah, piece as well. Yeah. So I start a scene with those guys and say, "Look, this is going to start down here, but by the end of this scene, I want you to have gone through the villa, out across the garden, be by the tennis court. When you finish this scene, like, what? Yeah, just come on, let's see if we can do it. Mm-hmm. And then we'd work out the shot to make that work. So, what's next? Obviously, you've mentioned the window. You yeah, I'm just finishing off the window, which is, you know, uh, that is a sort of. I'm not sure what's next, actually. I've got a project which I've been talking about for the last year, which is set in. Uh, Ireland and uh, in Canada mm-hmm. and it's set it's called Cursed and it's about a family a true story about a family called the O'Donnell Donnellys who went to um, a small little town in Lucan in uh, they emigrated in 1840 I mean Jim and his wife did and they brought up this big family in Canada and in 1880 the town of Lucan had just had such enough of this family they tried to massacre them and it's a story about the trial after that and who survived and the backstory of the thing that Donnelly's. That's been talked about for the last year and a bit. I'm attached. Um, my Canadian producers were in Berlin last week and we were talking to various people about it. Um, if it if it does happen, it'll happen April, May, June, and we'll start shooting in Ireland and, and near Toronto. Same. But I sort of don't know, with everything else that's going on in the world, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Yes, everything seems to be put in hold at the moment yeah well I've got a friend who actually is shooting in in Rome and um, he's on an English production in Rome and two American companies were about to start shooting in Rome and they both pulled out yeah yeah. it's not the best of places at the moment no. a friend who had just had to cancel a holiday to Venice yeah because there was no way they could well we do I mean you know it's, I think it's ridiculous but the impact of this is enormous mm-hmm. yeah you know, there's so many industries that will actually be affected by it you know? mm-hmm. maybe we'll have to rethink because of it, because you know. Yeah, there's going to be an awful lot of businesses in trouble, I think, over the yeah. next six, yeah. nine months. Yeah. Which is not a good thing. Doesn't help anything. No, I mean, that, you know, for me, it's like, when we say, what next? It sort of has to be next, really, because mm-hmm. I, you know, obviously you have to keep on earning a living. But yeah, of course, yes. I, I, I really enjoyed the film, and I'm glad that you got a good reception last night as well. That sounds as if it was. Yeah, it's funny, we went, I mean, it was in Dinard, and uh, I used to go to the, just before it started, and talk to the audience, and then it comes on and nip back. And I, I was just amazed how. Um, Responsive it was, and the age gap, you know, mm-hmm. would be anyone from sort of 20 to 70 would be having a good time, yes, which seemed enjoyable, really. Uh, I think it has a lot, you know, it has a lot to say about. I mean, I think when we first started that film, we thought we'd it would tie Brexit into it more, but I thought that was a danger because you never know what was going to happen. You don't happen. really know what's going to happen, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, there was a little element of Brexit in there because that's all we were obsessed with at the time, yes. It's, uh been fairly common over the last what three years maybe yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I, I noticed that they mentioned sort of post Brexit and the uh, publicity materials yeah. as well and I thought it was quite timely but because it's been going on for so long it's quite easy to, yeah. for you to put elements of that in without actually 
really speaking to it or one way or another. You're just yeah. sort of laying out the laying out the facts. Yes. Have you seen the Ned Kelly film yet? I have. Yes. What's it like? It's excellent. It's beautifully shot, and I really like the fact that it's a completely unreliable narrator throughout the whole film because it comes up at the start saying this is not a and then that fades and it just says true story so it's it's just excellent George Mackay again just yeah, dis- he disappears into roles he just becomes he's kind of, you forget that it is actually George Mackay yeah, yeah. a lot of the time because I've kind of followed him sort of throughout his, his short career and the the variety of work that he does is just absolutely yeah, fantastic but yes it's a, a great film I Thought the, the the sort of the smaller roles in as well, Charlie Hunnam. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So it, it's just just a great film, and it doesn't feel like two hours and ten minutes. Yeah, it yeah. feels really, really quick, really rapid. I I, I saw one of his first films, was Snowtown, mm-hmm. uh, which was just a gobsmacking film. I thought mm-hmm. and disturbing. Yes, the, um, <clears throat> it's quite raw in a yeah. way because it was a, a difficult time for people yeah. to live in and everything. So. It doesn't really pull his punches in no, that respect. No. He, he just it kind of shows it as yeah. it is, you know, the, the things that people had to do to survive. And yeah. the fact that they were regarded as being second, if not third class citizens yeah, within yeah. this very sort of harsh environment. People tended to come together and work together, but anybody with any sort of criminal background were just almost shunned and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's very it's quite a powerful film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know how well it's going to do because of that. Because no, it's, not, interesting, it's a it? difficult film <clears throat> to to market. It was only I, it was released last week, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. And I just read a couple of reviews for it, so I was intrigued about it. And I'm intrigued, you know. But I've watched, I've followed his work because I think he's an interesting director. And it, you live, I think he lives in the UK at the moment. But mm-hmm. he, you know, he's um, and it was also made by one of the uh, producers on this. David Orkin's company produced it. Um, so I was intrigued about how well it was going to do. And they had a, quite a battle making that as well, but yeah, I'm sure they did. It's, yeah. I mean, it must be a, an uphill struggle yeah. trying to get funding for yeah, yeah. a project that you believe in and you believe they can find an audience. Yet you're having to persuade people to yeah, yeah. to part with um, money, yeah, absolutely, millions of dollars a lot of the time yeah. to in order <laughs> to produce something because obviously they're doing it because they're expecting a return on it, but you're yeah, doing yeah. it more for a, the artistic reasons trying yeah. to get a piece of work out there something that's maybe got a message on it but yeah. that's the kind of stories you hear all the time yeah. the projects that they never seem to or they almost get there but it's just the funding is pulled at the last minute you know there's been a lot of examples of Terry, Terry Gilliam yeah. yeah so <laughs> he's <coughs> his whole career trying to so you get films off the ground and then they're, they're failing or whatever and uh, there's a very good uh, podcast Simon Bruce film stories oh, yeah. where he talks about films b- pre- predominantly from the 80s and he talks about the sort of production issues that they had and nine times out of ten it's all got to do with the money and the funding and people dropping out at the last minute and things and this is what actually makes these sort of background stories really interesting but it must, it must be very frustrating if you're in the eye of that storm where you've got everything ready to go and then a couple of weeks before yeah. you're told uh, we might not have the money to do this so you need to uh, well, we cut it down. Funny enough, even on Denmark, we had a gap because suddenly um, Rafe hadn't signed his contract, and suddenly mm-hmm. uh, Amy Schumer had rung him up and asked him whether he'd be in a, f- a film. And you know, he's a friend, so he said, "I don't know what to do it because this is, you know, Amy Schumer. And I, I think I should do it." And I said, I said, "What impact will it have on the film?" I said, "Well, it will put it will delay it by twelve weeks. You know, twelve, you know, it'll be three months before we start shooting this film." And um, I, it, eventually, he, you know, his agents had, had agreed that that's what he's going to do. So suddenly, everyone stopped for twelve weeks. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying to the producers, no, this is just a disaster for me. Like three months, just I can't, it's not like I've, I've got pots of money in the bank, I can just sit around waiting for a rave. Yes. We did, we did actually, and it did, we finally got there. But those things happened, that's only a small thing that happened. But mm-hmm. And then the weird thing was he never got his visa, so he never did that film. <laughs> and it, there was another whole thing about whether Trump had some to do, you know, because yes. his tumors, uh, uh, brother or kind of father is actually you know very opposed to Trump and it was going to fuck him over anyway it's another whole story yeah. <laughs> that's not true ok <clears throat> thank you very much oh not a problem yes I uh, really enjoyed it thank you very much thank you it's a pleasure to meet you